Welcome to lecture 18 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we're going to take a deeper look at some of the components of an OFDM transceiver, including the cyclic extension and bit allocation. So we saw this concept in the last lecture, something called cyclic extension, but but really, why is it there? Why do we care about having some sort of buffer in between every composite OFDM symbol? The answer is uh, intersymbol interference, or ISI. Uh, the mathematical formulation that allows us to use the IDFT and the DFT in order to create these composite waveforms and then decompose them is all contingent on the fact that we do this one OFDM symbol at a time. But remember, if we pass anything through uh, a multipath fading channel or multipath channel that has some sort of dispersion, there is a likelihood that some symbols, samples from the previous OFDM symbols, get smeared or dispersed into subsequent OFDM symbols. And this causes problems because we then cannot really recover using the DFT at the receiver, uh, the individual subcarries without some substantial amount of distortion caused by these uh, uh, previous OFDM symbols and their echoes and such. So the cyclic extension is there to make sure that every OFDM symbol is sufficiently spaced out enough in, frequent, in, in time sorry, such that uh, we don't get copies of samples from previous OFDM symbols influencing current ones and therefore we can actually use the IDFT and DFT without worry of having any intersymbol interference or ISI from other sources. But, but so, so, so what, why should we be worried? Well, the main thing is, is that in a lot of cases we might be uh, faced with a scenario where we're operating in a multi-path multi propagation environment, as we're going to see right now. So remember my, my indoor model for multipath propagation. So we have a room, we have a transmitter, we have a receiver, right? TX, RX. And then what happens is we have the wireless signals propagating in the environment. Oh, look at that. So that's our line of sight component. We may or may not have that in real life. Here's one that reflects. Here's another one that reflects. Um, and so on. So we have all these reflections and such. And what ends up happening is, just like what I described before, we can characterize this in the time domain as essentially a collection of delayed deltas that each represents the uh, sort of like uh, like each each copy, if you will, of the original transmit sig signal that has some sort of delay. So let's say this guy here is our line of sight component. And because it's the shortest distance traveled, it's going to have the highest signal strength, and it's going to be from, let's say, time zero, it's going to be the first one to arrive at the receiver. And then all these other copies are all the reflections from this room and such. And so this is a problem because this dispersiveness, right? Dispersiveness is a problem. This is this uh, this sort of wire, this sort of echo, if you will. So a way of viewing this is essentially if you were at the Grand Canyon and you you shout out uh, like "Hello," um, and you hear all those copies um, uh, bouncing back at you. Uh, that that's what the wireless receiver would be hearing. You'll be getting the original signal. So hear "Hello." And then here's a copy, hello. And here's another copy, hello. And so on and so forth. And it's up to the receiver to figure out which one, it, which one's which. But what happens is, let's say you're trying to read Shakespeare and you're yelling at the top of your lungs at the Grand Canyon. Soon, especially if the reverberation is quite intense, all the, what's going to happen is you're going to hear all these copies all overlapping with each other, and you'll. Unless you have really, like, you know, your, your, your brain is capable of doing a lot of sort of post-processing of all those copies, it will become gobbledygook. You won't be able to really pick up any words. It will all sound kind of like mixed in together and won't make any sense. And that's exactly why we need things like equalization and, and in particular, also this idea of the cyclic extension. So how does the cyclic extension work? Well. Let's look at one type of cyclic extension called the cyclic prefix, where we take 
the last several samples of an OFDM symbol and we make a copy of them and we affix them to the beginning or the prefix of an OFDM symbol. And we're going we're to see how that catches the dispersion of the channel. So the way the cyclic extension works is as follows. We take every OFDM symbol, so this is the time domain. Okay. Okay. So let's say that's symbol n, that's symbol n plus one, that's symbol n plus two, and it goes off the page. That's like symbol n minus one. And what happens is we take let's use a different color. We take the last l samples of every symbol. So this one goes off the page. This one is there, and then copy it to the front. So we take L, we take L, we take L, and we take L there, and so on for all of them, and we copy those guys over here. And so what we're doing essentially is we're taking these same symbols and we're copying it over here, and the reason for that is that's our cyclic prefix, okay? So we call it CP, CP, CP. And what ends up happening is that when we have the multipath fading channel, remember that profile, that uh, channel impulse response that I just drew before. Uh, let's make that look worse, okay? And so this guy here, um, so suppose we have it now, this is our last sample here of the previous symbol. And so let's say, worst case to worst, we have this dispersion. It gets all caught by the cyclic prefix. Same thing here. The last possible symbol, the sample of the nth symbol and the nth plus one symbol and all these other symbols spill into the cyclic prefix of the subsequent symbol. And what do we do at the receiver? The first thing we do is we discard the cyclic prefix. Once we know where that cyclic prefix prefixes, we remove it. And the reason for that is we make sure that every symbol is in the time domain isolated from every other symbol because ultimately what we want to do is mitigate the impact of ISI. So now that we saw how cyclic extension can be used in an OFC, OFDM transceiver, let's look at another beautiful aspect of multi-carrier modulation, in particular with OFDM transmission and reception, which is called uh, adaptive bit allocation. So the premise behind OFDM is this idea of divide and conquer, where um, we can spectrally and temporally take data, redistribute them across several narrowband low speed transmissions called subcarriers, we then convert them into frequency domain, add them together, make a composite waveform, and transmit them across a channel, and then receive them, and then decompose it back into its subcarriers, treat them individually, and then reconstitute the original high-speed transmission. This is all great. This is powerful stuff. Um, and one beautiful attribute of this is the fact that we also, because we are treating um, each subcarrier as its own narrowband transmission, we can also fine tune how much information we can put on each subcarrier based on the prevailing channel conditions. We can tailor the subcarriers, especially with respect to modulation scheme, such that let's say one subcarrier that corresponds to a portion of the frequency channel that's not doing so hot, we might choose a very robust modulation scheme that only modulates a few bits per symbol, while a portion of the channel that is do, that is that has really nice characteristics that a subcarrier is located might want to take advantage of the situation and use a very high data rate modulation scheme where we map many bits to a single symbol. So we're going to look at that right now, how we're going to implement this. And, and we're going to use something called an adaptive commutator. So the adaptive commutator, we saw commutators before, but this one's special. Before we made the assumption that the commutator arm spends about the same amount of time on every subcarrier dumping the same number of bits that uh, should should that should be um, then converted into a symbol and then transmitted and modulated and all that into a composite OFDM waveform. In this case, what we're going to do is the uh, duration and number of bits that 
uh, are allocated per subcarrier will actually be different. It will be based on the quality of the portion of the channel that that subcarrier needs to operate across. So we have an intelligent commutator. And so there needs to be some sort of feedback from the receiver about which channels are good and which ones are not. But once you have that information, you can employ that commutator as we're going to see right now. So a commutator in general, the, the conventional one, essentially looks like follows. So you have your high speed input, your rotating commutator arm, and then one of several, in this case, N, N leads. And the commutator head essentially makes contact for a certain duration, uh, T seconds, and offloads the same number of bits on each one of these subcarriers that then gets carried out. So what ends up happening, <clears throat> especially since uh, if you spend an equal amount of time on each commutator branch, um, what you do is you effectively, each one of these subcarriers has one nth the rate, the data rate, than the original uh, incoming stream X of M. So this is your um, conventional commutator. On the other hand, an adaptive commutator slightly different. Instead of spending the same amount of time and offloading the same number of bits on each one of the leads for each one of the subcarriers, it spends actually, let's say, longer or shorter and offloads more or less bits per subcarrier branch and that's due, in fact, to whatever sort of feedback information it gets from the receiver in terms of the channel condition. So let's say this guy here, this subcarrier and that subcarrier and that subcarrier, all of these lie in, let's say, uh, channels that have poor signal to noise ratio. I may want to use something like BPSK or QPSK, which is more robust. And then these guys might be in better channels, and I might want to put four or five or six bits per subcarrier, which might be 16 qualm or 256 qualm. So I might want to add more bits, but the symbol duration, they've all got to be the same, dura uh, same length of time. But what we do is we choose uh, different modulation schemes. So let's say BPSK for that guy and that guy. Maybe this guy is not as bad, so we give QPSK for him. And then the other ones we give more robust uh, sorry, more, more um, a, a higher order modulation schemes that have more data per symbol. Um, and that's probably due in, in mostly in part to the fact that they might lie in parts of the frequency band where subcarriers occur that have much, have much better uh, signal to noise ratios. So this is our adaptive, adaptive commutator. So once you have uh, that, that adaptive commutator working and that feedback channel from the receiver telling you what subcarriers uh, are, how they're performing in various parts of the channel and which ones are not performing so well. Um, so this, this has some sort of overhead channel between the transmitter and receiver. Um, what we then need to do is we need to actually figure out what is the best number of bits to allocate per subcarrier based on the prevailing con uh, conditions. And this is tricky because uh, for the most part, it really comes down to trying to optimize every subcarrier. And the more subcarriers you have, like let's say you have 1,024 subcarriers, that's a lot of degrees of freedom in order to optimize what is the best number of bits per subcarrier. Okay? So what we do is we use um, optimization theory, like these expressions here. Like, suppose we want to maximize the number of bits that we transmit per OFDM symbol, and it's subject to, let's say, an error constraint, that um, the total aggregate error across all the subcarriers averaged out um, cannot exceed some sort of threshold. So what we need to do is we need to come up with some sort of algorithm that says that uh, tries to allocate and then tests against this um, what we call a uh, uh, cost function. We want to see how well does it perform in terms of does it give us the highest throughput but still satisfies this error constraint, this error robustness constraint, PE, the probability of error. 
So and and so there you you'll anticipate some sort of iterative process in order to converge to the best possible allocation of this bit given this error constraint. Some folks actually devise a, a more closed form solution, such as uh, the one that uses um, Claude Shannon's um, uh, capacity exp expression with something called an SNR gap. So we remember several lectures ago, we looked at this idea of assessing how much information we can cram into a channel given a specific signal to noise ratio or SNR um, uh, uh, and, and get error-free communications for a specific bandwidth and coding rate and all that, right? Well, now let's look at something a little bit more different, like what we see here in, in uh, equation two, where der we derive from Shannon's capacities expression, we use something called an SNR gap. And this SNR gap is a little bit of a fudge factor. What it does is using this, um, given sort of the, uh, the modulation scheme that we're dealing with. So um, for instance, uh, you can use something like a, a union bound um, on, on the, the probability of error threshold in order to get this uh, SNR gap, which you feed back into this variant of Shannon's capacity. And what, what this tells you is in one shot, no iterations, this is the number of bits that you're going to need in or per subcarrier based on the su signal noise ratio across that subcarrier, um, given the modulation scheme that you're using and the target error threshold that you're shooting for, um, PT. However, um, this is not a, a foolproof uh, approach because, first of all, this expression will give you um, a continuum of possible bit values, not a discrete number of bit values. So as a result, um, if you're transmitting information, you don't transmit um, fractions of bits, you transmit whole number of bits. So uh, we're going to have to do some rounding, some quantizing, and that will lead to some um, uh, suboptimality that might need to be corrected with some sort of iterative approach. Okay. Now, there are a few other uh, approaches out there uh, that, that take advantage of uh, tailoring the number of bits that get modulated into a symbol on each subcarrier for an OF OFDM transceiver. And, and, and again, like, uh, some of them are uh, based on a continuum of, of, of bit values, which then have to get discretized. And, and also that, uh, that SNR gap is an approximation, right? It comes from union bound. So um, you, might, you might still be better off using a heuristic or iterative approach and, and uh, go through multiple trials in order to get uh, some sort of final answer in terms of um, um, what the final bit allocation could be. And, and there are a number of approaches like in the discrete optimization world that might be able to help you with, with achieving this.